Good morning, Steam Power Plants class. It's uh, about eight o'clock on Wednesday. And uh, I thought I would go ahead and do a uh, lecture here and get it posted. Uh, we need to get through this turbine article. Uh, we'll get that done this week. I'll get this one and then uh, I'll post one more, I don't know, this afternoon or tomorrow and that will finish up this. And then next week we're gonna head into uh, uh, just two days of uh, kind of review of combustion uh, calculations. So without further ado, I believe this is where we uh, stopped off last time. This is slide uh, number 15. And uh, I will email these slides out. I'm still actually putting this uh, slide presentation together. Uh, I had never done that. So that's why I haven't already emailed it out. But I did email out the uh, document that it's coming from. So you already have uh, complete information <clears throat> on this. Okay, so uh, we're looking at how to operate uh, large steam turbines uh, at uh, a uh, utility, a power plant. And hot warm starts is the topic here. So let's jump into this. Uh, the main objective during warm and hot starts of a turbine generator is to provide steam conditions during starting, which will result in temperatures, which will closely match those already existing in the turbine components. <clears throat> so we would like to uh, introduce steam that after it goes through the control valves, will basically match closely the existing temperature of the high pressure and intermediate uh, pressure turbine metal. That's, that's the game here. The larger the mismatch of steam to existing metal temperatures, the higher the thermal stresses will be. And the higher the thermal stresses, we get, uh, we initiate cracking uh, sooner and <clears throat> you know, we're damaging the equipment. Uh, warm starts will generally be experienced following a weekend shutdown. Now, this document kind of assumes that the reason that we're cycling uh, these older fossil units is because nuclear units have become available that operate on a very regular schedule, i.e. you would probably base load a nuke, which is a big generating unit, typically probably 800 to 1500 megawatts, and then you would pick up the increases in load during certain portions of the day with the fossil units. These days, the cyclic service is even uh, more extreme as we have more and more renewables and the renewable output uh, jumps considerably. Obviously with solar, you don't get any at night, so that's predictable. And that could lead us into uh, perhaps a weekend shutdown where, um, uh, you know, load is down all weekend in general, uh, and so the unit goes down for that. Or hot starts, which, uh, are, which are commonly experienced on units subjected to two-shift cyclic or cycling duty, in which the unit shut down overnight and restarted every uh, weekday morning to meet uh, daily system peak load demands. Um, and also we'll get into just load changes here a little bit later in the presentation. And these fossil units are gonna be subjected to all kinds of <clears throat> just continual load changes based, in, based on the operation of renewables. You know, wind comes in gust, wind comes for blows, you know, pretty steady for an hour or two and then it subsides and something's gotta be there uh, if, you're, if, if a utility is relying uh, significantly on wind power. When the wind drops, there's got to be something there to pick up the generating load. <clears throat> or we're going to have voltage sags, which lead to brownouts and all kinds of bad things. So um, these fossil units, they may not be pretty, they may be old, and uh, they may have some emissions, but you, you know, unless something breaks, you can count on them. You know, you put in more coal, you get more power. You get more steam, you get more uh, electricity out. Whereas, you know, if the, you got a big solar array and you have a, a very cloudy overcast day, you just don't get much. Or the sun, you know, comes in and out behind cloud cover 
uh, as it moves by, you know, the power generation jumps up and down and we have to be able to uh, uh, account for uh, deficits in generation from renewables by having a hard asset online that can respond quickly. Uh, so such uh, cycling duty operation generally places the highest demands on turbine components and in, indeed the whole unit, but the turbine, because of the thick wall nature of the rotor, uh, is particularly susceptible to this type of uh, damage and cracking. Older uh, fossil boiler turbine units once baseloaded are relegated to cyclic duty as renewable power generation fluctuates with weather conditions. I think I hit that pretty heavy on the uh, previous slide. <clears throat> Often boiler main and reheat outlet steam temperatures at restart produce steam temperatures uh, in the turbine much colder than the existing turbine metal temperatures leading to thermal cracking in a short period of time. So what we'll see, it's called boiler droop, and we've got a figure here in just a minute that talks about it. But when a boiler is producing you know, 15, 20, 30%, of its rated steam uh, capacity, uh, the temperature of both the main steam and reheat tends to uh, reduce from its you know higher from its design uh, design temperature levels. For example, we may be shooting for a thousand degrees on both the uh, main steam and reheat, and when we're up maybe above 40, 50 percent, we get that. But when we're down at lower loads that steam temperature may fall off to, you know, I don't know, 850, 875, 900 uh, on both of those, depending on the particular unit and, you know, the condition of the boilers and all that sort of thing. So that's called droop and it occurs at low steam production rates. Well, if you're trying to match a hot turbine rotor and you can't, you know, say the turbine rotor is 950, and you can't get but you know 850 degree steam that's a hundred degree mismatch you know so when that steam hits that rotor um, it's going to cause thermal stresses and so that's something the operators have to take into uh, consideration <clears throat> uh, various operating procedures may be employed to provide better temperature matching during warm and hot starting we'll see that depending on the valving uh, configurations and how flexible it is uh, allowing steam into the high pressure turbine, uh, we may have some options here to be able to manage these temperatures. Uh, and we'll get into that in uh, a lot of depth and detail here going forward. <clears throat> uh, the combination of throttle uh, pressure and temperature at the turbine inlet, which produces steam temperatures to match existing internal turbine metal temperature should be provided. So operators, um, after they get some experience on a unit, they know what steam conditions they need in order to match a particular metal temperature, say at the exit of the first stage of the high pressure or intermediate pressure turbine. Those are the main temperatures they look at. Uh, we've got a figure here, number seven, showing representative operating charts used for warm or hot starts. And this is a bunch. Now these days, all of this would be provided digitally uh, and programmed into the control system. In the old days, these were the operating type charts that operators used. So I'll make a few comments on this. I don't intend to try to talk my way completely around this. Thing. Um, but it, I think it's uh, seeing these charts at least lets you know all of the different factors that have to be considered when you are uh, initiating a warm or hot start. Um, so if we start down here at figure one on the bottom, this has to do with the steam conditions. So what you do is you pick the pressure, and this is in hundreds of PSI G. So like 20 is 2000, 15 is 1500. And then you pick the throttle steam temperature. That's to the throttle valves, the, the main stop valves on the uh, turbine. 
Um, and so there's an example here. He's got a rolling example, a minimum load example. So let's say we're rolling. Let's say this is what, that looks like a thousand and eight hundred. Then you come uh, horizontally over here to figure two. And this shows the first stage steam temperature that's going to result at the exit of the first stage. And it's dependent upon the valve program that we have in the turbine. Now, we're, we haven't defined those, and I'm not going to do that on this slide, but it's coming very quickly. A uh, single valve indicates that all of the valves, and see, the, the way steam gets into these turbines, there are probably six or eight valves that control admission to the first stage or it, you know, in, into the first stage of the turbine. Uh, and they each control a different arc or segment of the 360 degrees of arc all the way around the first stage at the inlet. Um, and so if all of these valves operate in unison as if they're one valve, we would be on the single valve line. If, however, those valves are staged, that is called sequential valve operation. And like we may uh, start by admitting steam to, you know, 25% of the arc. So 25% would be what, 90 degrees. And so we might only be admitting steam to 90 degrees of the 360 degrees around the inlet to the first stage. So that would be an example of sequential valve. So we get different temperatures. And this, this curve assumes some particular sequential valve uh, operating scenario, which I don't even think it's necessarily uh, called out here uh, in the article. But at any rate, um, we can see that on this, uh, on this rolling example, if, if I was at 1,000 and 800, I come over here, that's gonna result in what about 680? as far as the first stage steam temperature. If I'm on single valve, if I was on sequential valve, I would come on over here to about 600. So there's 80 degrees of difference roughly in the steam at the exit of the first stage. Um, so we're, we'll follow this up and say it's a, a single valve operation. This figure three gives you the mismatch. So then you come up to whichever line indicates the metal temperature. And so let's say this steam uh, is going to be 680 at the exit of the first stage. We come up to the 600, say the thermocouple is reading 600. So we over here. And so you come over on this and this just does the subtraction for you. And so that's basically would be about 80 degrees of difference. And then from here you go into this chart, which has all kinds of stuff on it. But basically, this gives you information about old times, roll times, what, you know, how you should actually initiate the transient. And I'm not going to try to get into that here. But this is the type of information that goes into determining uh, how long a particular transient uh, it should take to initiate a particular, or a particular uh, warm or a hot start. Okay. All right, let's uh, define more about steam temperature droop. Um, the effect of the boiler main steam and reheat steam temperature droop characteristics in the low load range must be considered during warm and hot starting. These temperature characteristics are felt directly by the turbine and the amount of droop is greater for constant design pressure compared to sliding pressure operation. Okay, so let's get to the curves. So the dotted lines are for the main steam and the solid lines are for the reheat steam. So let's look at the main steam first. We have two different uh, sets of curves, at least at the low load condition. One is called variable pressure. Now, some boilers have the ability to what they call <clears throat> slide or vary pressure based on uh, the amount of steam that they're producing. And so, uh, now this, this doesn't show the pressure, this shows the uh, temperature. But if we have variable pressure or sliding pressure, 
operation, sorry, that mouse is. Uh, then we see that when we first uh, fire this thing off and start getting any steam out, this is showing that it's going to be about 900 degrees. And that's going to ramp up. And let's say that we're shooting for our main steam temperature is 1,000. Well, we have to get up to 25% boiler load, 25% of the rated steam production before we can get to 1,000. So um, if we have a turbine that's cool or hot or whatever, then we have to take this characteristic of the boiler and the, and the steam temperature that's going to be available to us into consideration when we start thinking about these warm and hot starts. Okay. Now, if we had a fixed pressure boiler, which I think the majority are, uh, but nonetheless, so we would see that its initial steam temperature is going to be about 850, and that's going to remain constant uh, until we get, uh, well, that's about halfway in between, so that's 11, 12 percent, and then that uh, steam temperature will ramp up with the steam flow until we hit about 50 percent. So we don't get to a thousand degree steam until we're at 50% steam generation or higher. Beyond that, they're both constant and maintained at a thousand. Well, again, this is what's called droop. So it's the, it's the lower temperature steam is the best the boiler can do at lower steam production rates. And then these curves, the solid curves are for the reheat steam and we see initially they take off together about 850 and then the variable pressure uh, comes up quicker which can well be an advantage uh, and so at 50 percent uh, steam production we get it up to its rated amount which could be 950 or a thousand whatever uh, but with the uh, uh, fixed pressure, constant pressure boiler, it's going to come up more slowly and we, it doesn't get to its peak until the 60, 62% load, in which case then uh, it's at its uh, full value for the rest of the load range. So this is important and this is something operators, you know, I mean, they become second hand to them because they deal with this every day but it's an important characteristic that has to be considered, that steam temperature droop. So you need to be sure you know what that's all about. Okay, some more notes uh, from the article. Uh, often the desired higher throttle temperature cannot be obtained until higher flows exist in the boiler. So once we get up to say 50% load or greater, then we can get the desired higher uh, steam temperatures. To avoid, to avoid forced cooling of an existing hot turbine with relatively cold steam, it may be necessarily necessary to roll the unit as quickly as possible to rated speed, synchronize, i.e. tie to the grid, and add a higher than normal minimum load in order to produce higher steam uh, temperature throttles higher temperature throttle steam temperatures. Well, it's a little awkward, but I think you get the, the point. Um, if the rudder is hot, it hasn't been down maybe, but for a shift, um, and the best we can do is generate colder steam, we may want to do that as quickly as possible because we're going to force cool that rudder, and then we're going to turn around and heat it back up again. So let's minimize the force cooling by getting through that portion of the transient as quickly as possible. So that's what they're saying. Uh, prolonged rolling with colder steam results in forced cooling followed by reheating of turbine components resulting in additional thermal cycling. So, you know, depending on the valve programs in the turbine and the kind of controls in the boiler, not all boilers have sliding pressure capability. Probably most of them don't. And so the operator may be limited, but anyway, the article is pointing out, you know, the concepts that may be available depending on the particular unit under consideration. Okay, turbine bypass systems. Another way to um, 
get around this problem is to generate steam and don't take it through the turbine. If the steam is too cold, bypass and basically condense that steam and just keep running the boiler up in load, wasting, basically wasting the steam. You're not throwing the steam away, but you're throwing the heat away to condense it uh, in, in order to be able to match temperature on your rotor and avoid the uh, uh, thermal fatigue damage on the high pressure and intermediate pressure rotors. So let's read the bullets and then we'll look at the picture. Turbine bypass systems are common on many European units and on units designed for two shift operation. So Europeans have done this much more than uh, folks in the States. Bypass systems provide temperature matching capability in both high pressure and intermediate pressure turbines for a wide range of conditions. In most cases, the cost and physical space limitations make retrofitting a bypass system on an older unit impractical. Uh, a lot of the fossil units in the States were built quite a while ago. They were not put in and they do require space and it's like the third bullet says, it's difficult to retrofit, which means go back and add one later. Probably not impossible, but difficult. Okay, if we look at the diagram, so let's start down here at the feed water pump. So this is coming out. Normally we would just pump the feed water into the boiler, but we have an extra pipe that's added, which lets us bypass the boiler, okay? <laughs> so we'll see that in a second. So our superheated steam comes out of the boiler, but we're gonna bypass the turbine. So these valves are closed. So we don't take any steam into the turbine. We come up in this line, this valve would be open, the high pressure bypass valve. And then we're gonna take some of this feed water and spray it in, in order to reduce the temperature on this. So basically we're just gonna kind of quench the steam at this point. Then it's gonna go back to the reheater. This would be part of the boiler, uh, get reheated. And then we're gonna come back. And again, we're not gonna go into the, I, the IP slash LP turbines. These valves are gonna be shut. And this valve is gonna be open and we're gonna come down here towards the condenser. And then at this point, we're gonna mix in some condensate liquid coming out of the condenser, we're gonna pump it back and spray it in here because we wanna cool this stuff down and um, reduce the load on the condenser the best we can. And so we do that, we spray it in, we take it into the condenser, we got lake water going through the condenser or something in order to take that heat away. And then we go back into the condensate pump. Most of it goes back you know, on through the feed water heaters and all that stuff that's in between. Uh, this bends back around to quench this, uh, uh, the steam out of the, the, the reheat steam, I guess. Uh, and so we can simply bring the boiler up to higher and higher steam production rates, which gets us up in temperature to the point we can then match. So whenever this temperature gets high enough that we don't damage the turbines, then we start closing this valve, we open these valves, and we start getting this unit online in terms of generation. So that's what a turbine bypass system is about. And again, you don't see many of these in the States, uh, much more so in Europe. Turbine temperature matching. Uh, one method of reducing the temperature mismatch during hot restarts of older units is to lower the temperature of the turbine components during the previous shutdown sequence by maintaining full throttle pressure while using sequential governor valve mode, utilizing the greater boiler temperature droop and lowering the load to the recommended minimum load level before taking units offline. Okay, you all don't understand that yet, but once we get to these diagrams that show, uh, if you, keep your uh, boiler pressure high and go through the sequential valve procedure, you get lower steam temperatures. Lower steam temperatures will force cool the rotor and we bring it down in that control mode and it results in a lower temperature rotor because you know you're gonna have a, a quick restart on this thing 
and you know what temperature you can get out of your boiler. And so by force cooling the rotor a little bit on the previous shutdown, you set it up to make the next startup easier. These are things that operators learn and it becomes second nature to them. Okay, let's look at load changing. Load changes, now previously we were looking at warm and hot starts, but so from, you know, offline with different temperatures of rotors. Now this is just load changing. Load changes are accompanied by changes in blade pass steam temperature. Thermal stresses are developed in the rotor, which depend on both the magnitude and rate of change of the load. So if it's a small change, if you're going from, you know, 60% to 70%, that's not a huge, a 10% change in load is not huge. That could probably be done pretty quickly without with minimal upset and thermal transients in the rotors. If you're going from 25% to 100%, that's a huge change, and you're gonna to have to be much more careful. You've got a much bigger temperature change for the rotor, and you're gonna to have to manage that change over the appropriate length of time in order to not do excessive damage. Uh, there, there's no single rate of change can be applied uniformly to all turbine operations if the objective is to limit uh, the stress levels uh, to a level corresponding to a selected fatigue capacity. So we'll see, we have some curves coming and the curves basically give um, the number of cycles to expected cracking on the rotor. And so then you pick which curve you wanna operate on. It could be a thousand, it could be 10,000, it could be you know, 5,000. And that gives you some kind of a guideline in terms of how severe can the thermal stress cycle be in order to stay within that desired lifetime before cracking. That's kind of where this is going. Uh, small load changes can be performed uh, instantaneously when followed by a stabilization period <clears throat> without exceeding the limitation, whereas large changes must be performed less rapidly. So that kind of restates what I just said. Okay, load changing. Uh, more on load changing. The greatest variation of steam temperature over the load range occurs at the first stage of the high pressure turbine. So that is our number one control point. First stage steam temperature changes with both throttle temperature and load. So we know throttle temperatures are gonna change uh, based on uh, the amount of steam the boiler is producing. That's one, uh, one factor here. And then the other is as we change load, that's gonna change those valve positions and that's gonna also change the uh, first stage steam temperature. The amount of temperature change is also dependent on the mode of governor valve operation. So this is where we start getting into the details how some of the different options as far as uh, controlling the governor valves. Sequential valve mode is where multiple governor valves are sequenced to open or close in a determined order at either constant or changing <clears throat> inlet throttle steam conditions. Now, in the links to the videos online that I've asked you to watch, he does a really good job talking about this. And so <clears throat> I'm gonna add to that discussion, but you need to really watch those videos closely to make sure that you understand this. But for example, a lot of GE turbines will have eight valves that control the input of steam to the first stage. Each valve controls a 45 degree arc of admission. And so, you know, you've got what 360 degrees of arc if each valve is 45 degrees, eight times 45 is 360. And so that's how you can control not only the amount of steam, but which arc is active around the circumference of, or circumferentially on that first stage. Uh, single valve or throttling mode is where a group of governor valves open or close in unison to change the amount of valve flow passage area. 
And when we just say single valve, we typically think of all eight of those valves being in the same position. So if we have 50% steam flow, all the valves are 50% open, roughly. That sort of thing. Now, there are other options on that, and we'll get into that uh, in our more detailed discussions to come. Sliding pressure mode uh, where is where a group of governor valves are fully open or maintained at a constant partially open position, while the inlet throttle pressure, uh, that should say is instead of it, is changed to vary the main steam flow to the turbine. I'll have to change that, that's a typo. Um, just the, kind of the generic case, we consider, you know, like full, full blown uh, sliding pressure operation, the valves, all eight of them may be wide open and we simply control the steam flow into the high pressure turbine by, in, by sliding the boiler pressure up or down. The governor valves regulate the steam flow into separate nozzle chambers arranged circumferentially to admit steam generally in a 360 degree arc to the first stage blading when all valves are open. That's what I've been talking about. With If you had eight, each, each valve would control 45 degrees of arc into that first stage blading. Thus, each governor valve feeds steam to a portion or percent of the full 360 degree arc. In the sequential valve mode, the governor valves, as they open and close in sequence, feed steam through a changing circumferential admission arc to the blading. So at 50% with pure sequential valve operation, if you want 50% of the flow, you're gonna have half of the valves wide open. And what this does is that it uh, eliminates throttling. So if you have all of the valves 50%, they're all throttling the steam. Well, throttling represents uh, uh, an exergy destruction, and exergy is the potential to generate useful work. And so the more throttling we do, uh, the more of an efficiency penalty uh, will occur. And so by just using 50% of the valves full open and 50% of the valves shut, nothing is throttled and we'll find the heat rate or the, the heat rate uh, goes down or the efficiency goes up as we will see. Uh, the size of the arc passing steam can be expressed as the uh, percent of full arc admission. So, you know, we could be passing steam at 50% or 180 degrees uh, of that admission arc could be active and the other 180 degrees, the valves could be shut off. Okay, more on load changing. In the single valve mode, all governor valves operate in unison to vary the flow by changing the amount of valve opening while feeding steam to a full 100% arc of admission. That's you know, kind of classically what we mean by single valve mode of governor valve uh, operation. In the sliding pressure mode, the governor valves remain in a fixed opening and feed steam through a constant arc or a percent of admission. So we get the valve set, you know, it depends on what, you know, what steam flow we want. We could have 50% of the valves open, 50% of the valve shut, and then slide pressure up and down in order to adjust steam flow. If that's not enough, then we can crack more valves and continue with sliding pressure operation. So there's lots of flexibility here. Uh, the effects of these different valve modes of governor valve operation on first stage exit steam temperature and heat rate efficiency as, as throttle flow or load varies are shown in the figures uh, 10 and 11 below. We'll get to those on the next couple of slides. Sequential valve operation is thermally more efficient at lower loads we'll see compared to single valve and sliding pressure modes. However, with single valve mode, the first stage steam temperature changes uh, the most 
as load is varied and therefore requires more time to make load changes. So there's good and bad, you know, different effects that have to all be considered. Okay, so here's uh, these, this figure 10 and 11 are, I consider to be really pretty important, <laughs> all of this stuff. So this is uh, information for a particular generating unit. You can see it's a pretty big one. Uh, we get up close to 6 million pounds an hour at maximum steam flow rate, something like that. Uh, and this is the first stage exit temperature in degrees Fahrenheit. And so we have lots of different curves on here. So I guess the simplest one is the throttling control where say all eight of our valves are just in the same position. They might all be 25% open. They might all be 50, 75, 100% open. And we would simply move up and down on this curve and this would be at full, assuming full boiler pressure. Uh, you know, but you see the steam condition, and some of this steam condition could be, uh, reduction could be caused by boiler droop, and the other is the, the performance of this uh, valve program or valve mode. But we see down here, um, this is, if this is six million, this is what, one and a half. So I don't know, one and a half, I guess that's 25% or so steam flow uh, on this scale, roughly. And so you can see we're getting steam temperatures down here between one, uh, 830 and 840. Well, if the rotor is 950, that's not so good. You know, if the rotor's cold, then, you know, maybe that's not so bad, but, you know, it depends. And so if you have the capability to change from one valve program to the next, um, you can impact this steam temperature exit of the first stage and manage it to more closely match your metal temperature. So that's kind of the game here. Okay, then we have, this is constant pressure sequential valve. And so that's this solid curve. And what we're showing here is these are additional valves opening, and this is what's called the valve loop. So this portion of the curve is, um, <clears throat> uh, we're taking half of the valves, I guess, so they're not showing the valve loops on this. So they may be operating together um, or they could be individual. I guess they're still individual. They just don't bother showing the valve loops on them. But so we sequentially open valves. We come up here, this is 50% uh, and then we open one more valve. We go to 62.5%. We open one more valve. We go to 75% and this is showing the last two together. Uh, they might go individually, or I guess they could go together. It just depends on how that particular turbine is set up. But you see, so in general, the solid line is just kind of, they've kind of smoothed out these, even though there are these little bumps along the way, uh, they kind of smoothed out the uh, performance. And so you see uh, at initial startup, <clears throat> at the minimum uh, throttle flow that they show, uh, we're 770. Whereas at the constant pressure throttling control, we're 830. So what is it? That's 60 degrees difference in steam temperature. If you have a cold rotor, uh, you can do a better job matching by going to sequential valve at constant, you know, full boiler pressure in compared to throttling control, if you have that capability, okay? Then we have uh, the sliding pressure. And so let's start up here at the top. This would be all valves open. And then we simply increase steam flow by increasing boiler pressure or sliding the pressure up on the boiler until we get to the maximum uh, condition. And so you can see there's not a lot of steam temperature variation. We're starting up here at 940 and we're winding up 
uh, looks like about you know, what, 920, 925, something like that. So you know, that's maybe 15 degrees of variation <clears throat> over the entire load range. Okay. Now, we see this represents 75%, okay? And so this is a sliding pressure line. So this is with 75% of the valves open, slide the boiler pressure up until we hit full boiler pressure and then open the last two valves. So this is kind of a combination of sliding pressure until we get to full pressure and then sequential valve to come on up to our total boiler flow. Uh, this is 62 and a half, so this would be five valve, five of the eight valves open all through this. Increase pressure on the boiler until we get to full pressure, and then we can open one valve and then two more valves to get to full flow. And this shows 50%, so four valves open, four valves shut, slide pressure up to the maximum boiler pressure, and then start popping valves open as we go up through here. So uh, you need to spend some time and learn this because this will definitely be covered on our uh, final exam. Okay, next let's look at the heat rate or the efficiency. So heat rate is the BTUs of input fuel required to generate a kilowatt hour of electricity. And so um, you see uh, lower heat rate is good. It's kind of like one over efficiency and it's got units on it. So if you divide this by uh, what 3413, that converts the BTUs to kilowatt hours and you got it's dimensionless. And then you have to invert it, take one over it. And that'll give you the boiler efficiency. So for example, let's just do that. If you take, oh, let's just take 8,600, 8,600 divided by 3413, that's 2.52. And if I take one over that, that's 39.7% uh, would be the efficiency. If I check at uh, 8,100 divided by 3413 is equal to, 2.37, one over, that's 42% efficiency. Now, this is not the entire unit efficiency because units are not that. At Kingston, their overall heat rate um, is probably 10,000, 10 to 11,000 right now. But you can uh, include different things in heat rate. You can include auxiliaries, you can include fans, and that sort of thing. So this could just be boiler fuel and uh, turbine output without other uh, parasitic loads being considered. But you notice, so uh, what's the worst? The worst, the, the, the highest of, uh, uh, heat rate is the lowest efficiency. So the worst one is constant pressure throttling control. Well, because we know this throttling uh, destroys the ability to do useful work. And so it's the worst that we've got, okay? So, and that shows as a function of throttle flow, what that heat rate is plotted out. Of course, they all come together here at the, at the, the full load uh, condition. We also see the steam flow here. It looks like it's about 6.2 million pounds an hour uh, maximum. <laughs> okay, sliding pressure, all the valves open and just simply increase pressure uh, at the boiler. And that's the next worst because this is this throttling is going on uh, a lot of it at the boiler instead of just at the turbine. So there's still throttling involved here. Um, let's see here. So Let's see, this is 50% uh, admission, constant pressure, sequential valve right here. So this is half of the valves open and constant pressure. And so we come down uh, this to this point and then we start pop popping additional valves. 
So we go from here to 62 and a half, to 75 and a half, to 87 and a half, to 100 percent. Okay, and then these are hybrid. type uh, situations. Let me see. I take, I take that back. Uh, this, this, the, the sequential valve by itself is this solid curve here. I'm sorry. This is the 50% uh, of the valves. And then we pop one, two, three, four valves open. This is sliding pressure. These with dash lines are what they call hybrid. Sorry, I got that. Uh, it's easy to get confused on this one, but this is hybrid with 50%. This is hybrid with 62.5%. This is hybrid with 75% admission. So the hybrid is sliding pressure down to this point, and then it becomes, that's where the pressure goes to full boiler pressure, and then we start popping valves as we come down here. So this line, 50% admission, um, this is going to slide pressure to this point. This is 60, this is five valves open, and we're sliding pressure down to this point, and then we're opening valves. And this is um, six valves open, sliding pressure down to this point, and then open from there. And this dark line here is the sequential valve. So this is just opening uh, valves as we, as we get down to uh, this point, okay? All right, so load changing. Sliding pressure mode results in the smallest change in first stage temperature, and thus permits faster load changing rates. So we say sliding pressure is the smallest change in first stage temperature. So if we go back, and yeah, we certainly see that. So this is with all of the valves we've got a 15 or 20 degree change. So now this is with what? Six of the valves we slide and then we have to open valves to get up to here. Okay, however, the ability to operate with sliding pressure mode depends on the boiler and its boiler turbine controls. A lot of units don't have that possibility. So it may just be a theoretical discussion. Sliding pressure is beneficial for a unit being subjected to daily load following type of cycling as it minimizes the changes in first stage exit temperature, thereby minimizing thermal stresses. And say if we're, we're doing daily load following, we're keeping the, the turbine rotor hot. And so if the rotor's hot, these high steam temperatures look good to us. And so that's a good way to operate if you have that ability. Um, load following cycling is when high or full load is carried during the peak demand period and then the units kept online carrying low loads during off peak. So, you know, you just basically, uh, when the load goes up, this is the, this would be the unit that picks up the increase, whereas the other units stay kind of base loaded. Uh, hybrid mode. A mode of load changing using a combination of sequential valve at constant pressure mode in the upper load range and sliding pressure uh, mode over the lower load range is called hybrid. Hybrid mode is of great benefit for load following uh, cycling operation as it provides optimum thermal efficiency while operating at low loads and results in first temperature, first stage temperature changes, which are less than those experienced using either sequential valve mode at constant throttle pressure or single valve at constant pressure. Uh, using hybrid operation with sliding pressure at low loads with 50% of the valves open, followed by sequential valve at full boiler pressure from 50 to 100% load is recommended. And so, uh, this is thought to be probably the, the best heat rate, the best, uh, uh, the, the best way to operate. If we go back to the heat rate curve here, you can see that. So here it is, it's this line 
and then coming down here. So we see efficiency wise, that's the best. And it does, so he's just kind of highlighted that one on this, you know, with this kind of dark uh, dotted line or whatever. So that's kind of uh, the recommended operating mode if you have uh, that capability in terms of being able to slide pressure and do sequential valve operation. Okay, load changing procedures. Operating charts are generally provided to assist the operator in determining the length of time to change load or the load changing rate. Load changes at lower loads are generally accompanied by changes in inlet steam pressure and temperature, both of which affect first stage temperature. To select load changing rates consistent with say, you know, you pick a curve, say it could be the 10,000 cycle fatigue index curve uh, recommendation or other, you can pick another one of the cyclic life curves. The influence of steam inlet conditions on first stage temperature must be considered. Figures one and two below provide information necessary to determine first stage uh, temperature changes for any combination of load and inlet steam conditions. A family of fatigue index curves are shown in figure three um, as a function of first stage temperature change and the time to change the load. So this is kind of what, in the old days, this is what the operator got. Again, this would be in the DCS uh, today, but it's, I think, illustrative. So we have the same sort of uh, situation we looked at before. This would be the throttle steam pressure and throttle steam temperature. So for example, you pick whatever you have and then you come across and you have to pick your valve program again. And so depending on if it's sequential valve or single valve, you get a uh, first stage uh, exit steam temperature. And then, so by knowing where you are, where you're gonna be, the operator can determine what the delta T for that first stage metal is going to be. And then he goes to a fatigue curve such as this. And so um, using those previous slides and knowledge of the unit, you determine the, the first stage temperature change. So they're showing, um, well, you can, you can pick, uh, whatever let's see here's one this looks like it's a 200 degree change so if you were operating on the 10,000 curve which he kind of recommends here i think that we go down and say this load there's what 40 50 60 is that 50 about 53 minutes in order to initiate this transient if you were going to do this one this is that's a 200 degree change um, that's about a 225. That would should be take about 68 minutes. If you were going to do 250 degree change, you could come over here to the 10,000, and that would say you should do it in about 80 minutes, something like that, in order to have this number of cycles before a detectable crack would be expected. Okay. The fatigue index or capacity is the number of symmetric heating and cooling cycles. Remember, it's alternating stress cycles. The rotor material can experience before thermal cracking occurs. For example, a 250 degree, a change of 250 in one hour falls almost on the 5,000 cycle line. So let's see, if we go one hour, 250, it's pretty close. It's maybe a little more severe than that, but it's pretty close to the 5,000. Okay. Uh, and therefore accounts for one five thousandth or 0.02% of the total fatigue capacity of the rotor if you initiate that alternating stress cycle. 100 cyclic rep repetitions of that cycle would result in a 2% uh, depletion 
of the total fatigue capacity, leaving 98% capacity available for other operation. So that's kind of how you can use this uh, fatigue data to give you some sort of a guideline on how to operate the, uh, uh, the rotors. Okay, shutdown procedures. Except in an emergency, load should be removed at a rate determined from the guidelines provided on the uh, loading, load changing charts. Uh, if it is desirable to keep the turbine in a heated condition, ready for a hot or warm restart, certain actions taken during unloading will be beneficial. So, you know, the operator is most likely going to know what the plan is for the unit. And so he can tailor the shutdown sequence in order to leave the rotor temperature wise in as favorable condition to facilitate the next startup. So, you know, let's say we want to keep it hot. So, because well, we're going to, we're going to be down for eight hours and we're going to bring this thing back up. Okay. So if the unit has sliding pressure capabilities, lowering, the throttle pressure to lower the load will result in higher temperatures in the first stage areas, along with minimizing both main steam and reheat steam drooping. So if you go back to, gotta go back a little bit here. So if you wanna keep it hot, so you keep all of the valves open and you simply drop boiler pressure and we go along this line. So even, I mean, we, we even maybe heat it up a little bit because we want it hot because um, we want to keep it warm. You know, it, it will drop in temperature a little bit over the eight hours, but if you want to keep it warm or, you know, whatever your target is, if you had these capabilities, you could uh, close off these valves and then come out this line or this line or this line. So you can simply go backwards on this and kind of tailor the steam temperature that the rotor is going to see during the uh, shutdown procedure. Oops, one more. There we go. Okay, if governor valves can be placed in single single valve mode uh, before reducing load, the first stage steam temperature, steam temperature will remain higher at low load compared to sequential valve. Well, let's say you don't have sliding pressure. Okay, so if all you have is these two curves, this one and this one, then you're much better to come down on the throttling curve if you want to keep the rotor warm than the sequential valve curve. So that's all they're saying, you know, use these curves to make sense. Uh, and another possibility is uh, tripping the unit from a high load will also keep the unit at high temperature as steam flows abruptly stop and the insulated unit cools uh, slowly. I'm not aware that uh, many utilities actually just regularly trip units in order to keep them warm, but you know, I don't have full knowledge of what goes on out there either. Uh, to purposely cool down a unit during the unloading period in preparation for maintenance or to provide better temperature matching of the turbine, uh, with boiler startup condition, actions contrary to the above may be taken. These include maintaining full throttle pressure during unloading and keeping governor valves in sequential mode and lowering load to recommended minimum load level before tripping. So that's the sequential valve produce the lowest steam temperature. So if we want to cool it down, then we would want to shut down that way. Okay, I think that's about enough uh, for this uh, video. I'm going to stop right here and um, uh, we will finish this one up. Uh, I'll get another lecture out today or tomorrow and we'll finish this up and then we'll move into uh, uh, combustion for our, uh, next week's uh, material. Hope you guys have a great day and stay safe and stay well and I'll be back.